Hi, my name is Kate Arthur, and I'm Variety's Editor-at-Large. With me today is the cast of Succession, which was created for HBO by Jesse Armstrong. The cast has assembled from around the globe to talk about filming season two. We have Brian Cox, who plays Logan Roy, the family patriarch. Jeremy Strong, who plays Kendall Roy. Sarah Snook, who plays Shiv Roy. Kieran Culkin, who plays Roman, and the eldest Roy son and presidential candidate, Alan Ruck, who plays Connor. <laughs> also with us is Matthew McFadden, who plays Shiv's husband and Waystar Roy co-executive, Tom Wamsgans. Nicholas Braun, who plays Logan's grandnephew and human internet meme, cousin Greg. <laughs> Last but not least, Waystar Roy Co. general counsel, J. Smith Cameron, who plays Jerry. Jerry! Yay! Jerry alert! <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. So my, my first question is for Brian. Um, Brian, Logan starts out the second season having squashed Kendall's coup, but still having to fight off the hostile takeover. How did you approach his season two arc? <laughs> We don't actually get a knock. <laughs> it's a bit of a luxury to get a knock. I think we'll get arcs now because I've had time to write season three. So I think there's going to be lots of arcs there. But we didn't have, we don't have, a, we didn't have a knock. You just, you just start. We have a lot of knocks, but not necessarily arcs. Uh, we just started with, with it. You know, I can't remember what the first, what's the first episode again of season two? We were at the, we the summer that? palace, you know, in the middle of winter. Is that, is that the in uh, Southampton. Yeah. Is that the stinky raccoons up in the... Yeah, yeah, stinky What's raccoons. It? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we had to uh, come to a... You know, I realized that things had to be reformed, as it were. We had to really look at things again, in a way. And also, uh, I have to attend to the possibility of my new air as my other heir has sort of uh, blown it a little. So he's now in secret conversation with his daughter. Uh, I think that's right, isn't that right, Sarah? Is that right? Have I got it right? So long ago, I can't remember. And uh, then we uh, started to kind of shape it about how, you know, having season one being so much about Kendall, season two looked as if it was going to be more about the the blossoming of uh, of uh, uh, of um, what's her name, yeah. Siobhan. Yeah, sorry, Siobhan. So it, it's kind of you know it's kind of we kind of do it as we come along to it. I mean that that's been the kind of style of the show mm -hmm. is that we don't really know where it's going. At first it irritated the hell out of me that it doesn't know where we're going. But actually in the end, I actually liked that. I like the fact that it's, in, it's unknown. So in a way you can actually contribute you know, quietly to a sense of travel, as it were. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's no, you know, we have no, we had, we had no structure for that. And we also dealt with each episode as it came. So it was chronological. I think in the new paradigm, that will not be the case. But I also think, I also now know uh, what's going to be happening in season three, which I can't tell you, of course, but I do, I, oh my I, God. I was actually let in on that before I, um, before. What's going to happen? Yeah, tell us. yeah, man, tell us what's going to happen. What's going to go on? I, I, I can't us, break really. it down episode tell by episode. Tell us. I'm, I'm sorry, tell us. I'm sorry. I can't tell you. <laughs> But I was. I had, else to, to do. I, I had a meeting. Spill with the beans. Jesse. Spill them. I had a meeting you're, with Jesse. You're Logan just Roy. You can do lockdown. whatever you want. I, I had a meeting with Jesse just before lockdown, and he said, "Do you want me to know what's happening in the next season?" I said, "Hold on." I said, "No, I'm not sure this is right. You, I'm not sure you should be telling me this." But he told me, and uh, it's jolly exciting. That's all I can say. It really is, and it's very, very surprising what's going to happen. Oh my God. But I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You love it. Uh, look at him. I can't tell you. No, He's like <laughs> bad Santa. But I never, I never really, we never, he is, isn't he? Bad Santa. Yes. Yeah, this was completely new. Completely new because we didn't know from, you know, I think some people kind of 
tried to find out about their arc, but I, I gave that up. And then of course, then the surprise was Jesse telling me what my arc was going to be in the next season, which is- By the end of this knew. call, by the end of this call, you're going to spill the beans. No, I'm by not. By accident. No, I'm not. Yeah, by accident. This would be a great venue to spill it, Brian. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, well, I know, but it ain't going to happen. <laughs> um, Brian, do you think of Logan as cruel? How do you find his humanity in order to play him? Well, I think he's very human. I think he's incredibly human. Uh, there's more to him than meets the eye. He's slightly mysterious. I don't think he, I think he loves his children, but they are, kids, cover your ears. They are a little bit of a disappointment, shall we say. And uh, I, I think it's that little bit of a disappointment that he's been dealing with. Um, I mean, there was a question I asked Jesse from the word go, does he love his children? He said, yes, he loves his children, very much so. So once you've made that commitment, you then have to find a way of dealing with them uh, and their foibles, shall we say, for the want of a better word. And uh, I didn't find it, I mean, he, he is not a tolerant person. Um, um, Mr. Roy, and he's a bit quick, uh, but he's also, he also plays things close to his chest as well at the same time. And that's how he's able to achieve what he's been able to achieve, because he doesn't give everything away. And, uh, and he takes pause as he did in season two with the, the whole really meaningful thing of, of, of Shiv as the possible contender for taking over and that just didn't work out. It did not. Um, for the Roy children, Jeremy, Kieran, Sarah, Allen, how much time have you all spent figuring out the dynamics among your characters? Like whether, whether you're fighting over a phone or for your father's chair in the boardroom, you all feel just so much like siblings with years of history together. And I know that's not easy to do. How have you done that? I think we just sort of figure that out in real time on set. Um, we all have siblings, right? Yeah. So, I, I don't know. I feel like a lot of it's in the writing and then playing with each other. I think early on, um, I just slapped Snook in the face and she beat the shit out of me. So I think from there, it's just, <laughs> just sort of- Are you the most sibling Every, Everything fell into place. place. <laughs> what, Snook, what? So are you the most sibling kind of person? Like just inspire a sibling kind of relationship in the, like in a friendship? Me? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I still, I was just telling Jazz, my wife today, that um, I was holding the baby. Our baby's actually pretty fat at the moment. And I was like, I hope you don't inherit my like overeating thing. And my wife said, where'd you get that? And I said, I, there were seven of us. My mom would come home with like four corn muffins and I wouldn't be hungry. I would just have to eat one or I wasn't gonna get it. So I was just competing to eat. So I think my whole my whole life is living like in like a wolf pack of just survival. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's why it was not so hard for me to slap you up. I also think, Kate, I also think that we trust each other. Mm -hmm. um, that's and, it. And I don't think we really had to earn that even. I think I, I know that I trusted these guys really from the beginning and it was just an implicit thing, but there's a sense of we'll just follow each other's lead within a scene and we're all sort of all in all the time i think and so so it's it, so 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 you know that the moment you mentioned where we're struggling over kieran's phone uh you know it's not something you need to prescribe or rehearse you just sort of you know go for it with each other and, uh, and, 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 and in a way, uh, the show kind of lives dangerously in that way because you can, you can kind of find, find the limits with each other. I also think that there's uh, genuine affection and respect in the whole cast for everybody's abilities and just for, for uh, everybody as people and with the respect that, and the uh, trust that uh, Jeremy's talking about, you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere from there. People they also let us too. They must, they must rehearse and rehearse and rehearse because it looks so. And I, it occurred to me that we don't do any rehearsal really, very, very little. And it's just, um, 
I think it's sort of wonderful. It's the writing and it's just, it feels like a company. You know, we all sort of, it's, I think from the very beginning, from the pilot, it felt like that. I felt very sort of, I felt quite brave and free to screw it up or, you know, but I knew everyone was there, you know, so yeah. it's lovely. Everyone was there equally screwing it up. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there, there are things too, where we haven't really talked about the background of like what our childhood was like, not really. And there's something in that that I think is kind of cool because we all we kind of discover it in the moment as we're doing a scene. I can sort of visualize what our childhood was like without ever having really discussed it. And like as Jeremy said, it's kind of like a dangerous sort of area to live in because it might not hit or whatever. But there's something about when we like hang out in the boathouse, I felt a sense of like nostalgia for our childhood, even though I have no idea what that looks like. Me too. And, yeah. and and also in that scene, even you know that was from the other season, but I, I, it did feel like a discovery of ease, you know, mm-hmm. with each other, which 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 we all have, but we often don't get to live in a place of ease, in the material. Uh, but it's nice to know that there is that repose, and we had a bit of that, I guess, on the boat in a different way when we're when we're making fun of Sarah with with the with or, 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 with with the with the voices. <laughs> Making fun of you. Yeah. Making fun of you. Yeah. Um, Alan, will you ballpark for me what you think Connor's chances are in the election? Because I'm just looking around the world that we live in, and I sort of say he has a shot. This is the United States of America, and anything can happen. You just got to (laughs) believe. You just got to believe it, and uh, it just might happen. Get ready. Um, Nick and Matthew, cousin Greg and Tom, they both seem to have shreds of decency left. Why do you think they want to be in this family? I mean, it's exciting to be in this family. You know, once you get a taste, you sort of want to just keep it, you want to stay in. I think, you know, for me, coming from living with my mom, you know, sort of a pill popper, sort of a codependent weird relationship that we have I I come into this world and there's the potential for a lot of money and to be close to power and to learn how to be more powerful and to um, potentially like rise up the ranks and I think for the first time in Greg's life he's he feels like a value Um, so I think that's exciting for him I'd say much the same. And I <clears throat> think Tom's certainly in love with Shiv, you know, and that's... The, I thought that, you were going like, to say Greg, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Greg, yeah. That's well, just, well, Shiv, think, Shiv, yeah. Think that's about season three. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tom, Tom's in, uh, or he's sort of in constant flux of being frightened and kind of really wanting to be accepted and, you know, and and he's not without ambition, but he's... He doesn't, it's a, it's a lot of fear. Brian, Brian, you said something of, about warm scans after the first season that he's sort of just a, he's like a ball of panicky ambivalence. Yeah. Which I, <laughs> that's right. That's he's the shape I mean, That could be, could be yeah. true for a lot of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. Tom, Tom is a, a shapeshifter. He's so many different things to different people. He's totally you... different to everyone he meet, you know, and I guess yeah. we all are to varying degrees, but he really, yeah. And it's not, I don't think, it's nothing, it's not considered or, you know, there's nothing contrived about it. He's just sort of, yeah. I guess it's a way of surviving and I don't know. Nick and Matthew, um, can you talk about when you realized how well the two of you click? Was there a particular episode when you felt like it was working or started working? It doesn't feel like it's working yet, but um, <laughs> no, I know, but, uh, I know when I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say when we shot the pilot on the softball field, that scene where you're like, give me a kiss. Cause my understanding was you guys didn't even rehearse that. I remember the camera going saying, just go. And you guys did it. And I was on the other side of the field and I was laughing my ass off. I could barely hear you. And I was, laughing yeah. at you. I was like, this is great. That was, that was really funny, but even more than, even before that, we were shooting in the, um, in Logan's apartment, and both of us had gifts for Logan. <laughs> I had my little thing, and he had his watch box, 
And there was just a moment that I won't forget where it was probably the first take or something. And I was eager to give him my gross tissue paper, soggy, weird, sweaty thing. And you also had this thing and we shared a look and you looked at my box like, you're comp you also have a gift. And in that moment, I think we understood the relationship. Um, a little just sort of like, don't step on my toes thing. Yeah. And yeah, and that kind of rides through our whole, re our whole relationship. Yeah. I don't really like that you're real family either. Like the cousin. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't like that you're taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah, uh, well, I hunch a little. I hunch a little to get a little below you so that you feel better. So now we're going to play the first clip. For our first clip, we have the start of Roman and Jerry's very special relationship when he calls her from the training program. A feeling of hopelessness has set in for those watching from afar, leading many to wonder, what is the best way to explain this tragedy to children? Pierce News contributor David Stanton joins us. David, first off, are we obligated? Roman, what is it now? You know, I'm still pissed off they didn't give me any good footage. Seriously? They treated me like I'm a piece of shit. You are a piece of shit. Fuck you. I found a rough diamond out here, and I want to bring him back with me. Fast track him. Also, you should build my ride, bitch. I'll email you. It's genius. No, no. You're not building a ride that you came up with on your first day of management training, Roman. Well, you should. I am an ideas fountain. You're acting like an overexcited little boy. One fan emailed me and called the sex step dynamic between Roman and Jerry one of the sweetest relationships on the show, <laughs> which is certainly one way to describe it. How did that emerge? Jay, would you like to start? <laughs> well, I think we have the same idea that it can't, right? That when we were sh shooting the end of season one, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And we, uh, so sometimes what they do, oftentimes what they do is they leave the camera rolling after they finish run out of dialogue just to see what the creatures will do, how we'll behave. <laughs> and they just leave the camera rolling. And I think that Kendall and Roman were having a like a conspiratorial chat or something in the corner and they, and their conversation broke up and Roman drifted over to the bar where Jerry was sort of spying across the room at them. And we had a little repartee that was just made up some bullshit and then it was about martinis naturally mm -hmm. and then roman drifted out of the room and jerry just like looked checked out his ass as he left and i turned back to my martini and then a little bit later there was a laugh off camera and i learned later i think right karen that you looked back at jerry and i think that maybe they didn't use that footage obviously in that episode but no, I mean, Mark, my log told me that he saw it in the editing room that we both checked out each other's butts without knowing. <laughs> and he was like, there might be something there. But we weren't just talking about martinis. If you remember, like, it started off like a little bit kind of with a little sexual innuendo in character. And the, by the last take, I was basically asking if I could have sex with your tortoise. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. But like we, it was getting kind of gross. I think, but I was doing it the whole season, where like in character, trying to do something kind of sexy to Jerry, and you would just sort of flick me away. And I never thought that they would ever try to do anything with that. But uh, but it's cool. They kind of like experiment in the show. They're just yeah. like, Let's let's do a little bit and let's see if we like it. And I don't know. I've, yeah. I've like yeah. I've had to, I've had to masturbate like three times on camera on a show that my mom watches. But you know, it's nice to do that with you, Jay. Thank you. That's a Honor, Kieran, what do, what do you think Roman sexuality is? How do you describe it to <laughs> I honestly don't think he has any idea really either. Um, it's actually, we talked about it before we even shot the pilot and it changed a little and now it's just sort of, I kind of have my ideas about it, but honestly, I don't think that Roman has really thought about it much. So I only really would know as much as he knows, if that makes sense, so. Uh, it's me, got any theories? <laughs> I don't know. Um, the, the, the scene with Tabitha, um, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, 
Uh, Nick, given Cousin Greg's goofball persona, how do fans approach you? I just picture a lot of shouting of Cousin Greg. Like, is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, they yell on the street sometimes. It's nice that they put the cousin in front of it. Um, to keep, what happened you know, to Gregory? Keep my you People don't Gregory call me Gregory, now. and it really ticks me off. Um, use my That's going to take a couple a of seasons to land. That's not instant. It's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to really push that. No, sometimes they, more often than not, they call me Greg the Egg. Um, so that really stuck. But yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. What can I, what can I say? It's kind of, it's kind of weird. Speaking of cousin Greg, for our next clip, we're going to show the now infamous scene that had me both cringing and laughing at home. <laughs> Let's take a look at the start of the bore on the floor scene. Bore on the floor. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> okay. It's a game in the corner over there. Stand there. Go, 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 go. <laughs> All right. Tom? Me? Yeah. Uh, Pierce? Yeah. Um, well, that's a lot of <clears throat> factors and, but, Yes, I personally, I like it. Uh, I like it. Bore on the floor over there. Jerry, stand up. Stand up! Pierce. I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. Don't know. Have you played it before? No. Well, <clears throat> actually, I... To be perfectly honest, I've, I've had a few doubts. Honesty. You see, everybody, do you see? Honesty. Greg, stand up. Did you get any orders from my brother, the fucking conscience of the prairies? Me? Yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah, because I th I've had to, uh, some doubts too. Oh, fucking doubter, over there. But the rules are that you're spared if you tell the truth. Oh. And I just told you the truth. Oh, there are rules? Right. Do you know something, Greg? There are no fucking rules over there. Okay. <laughs> Roman. I like it for real, Dad. Stand I want the fuck up. Um, okay. Kendall took a call from the biographer. We all got a call, Rome. Okay, yes, but you see, he seemed like he wanted to actually talk to her. To smoke you out for dad. What? Well, fuck you, why do you get to smoke me out? I was smoking you out. What did you tell us about your mystery call? Oh, uh, the phone call? Uh, yeah, it was Frank. He meant to call you. He wants to know if the plan to overthrow dad is still happening. Someone spiked Pierce. Which one of you boys did it? Tom! Yes? Sit on the floor! It's fun. Seriously? Yeah, it's a game. Bore on the floor. I really, I feel... Get down! Bore on the floor. Bore on the floor. Kendall, ring the troops. Bore on the floor. Guys. Bore on the Cow, floor. Cow, get down. Bore on the floor. Greg, on the floor, Bore. Bore on the floor. Bore on the floor. Bore on the floor. Come on, Frank. Bore on the floor. Brian, good God. What did you make of it when you read what Logan had to do in that scene? Well, both uh, Tony Roach and I, Tony Roach who wrote it, and I who had to play it, were both very apprehensive whether it was going to work or not. I was worried because I thought we're get, I'm giving away too much of the sort of raging, um, the raging Logan. And I thought, oh, how do I get out of this? How do I recover from this? And then, uh, of course, I had to remember my own note that it's a game, you know. I, he, he does play these elaborate games, and he takes them quite seriously. Also, uh, the l level of treachery that's in the air is you could cut it with a knife. So he's finally said he's had enough of that, what's been going on. You know, he's just, he's just had enough. So he's reached a form of 
breaking point. He, he just, um, you know, he kind of realized that, that it was very out there and that, that kind of worried me, but actually it worked. Both to Tony and my surprise, it worked. And it became, you know, a sort of episode that people kind of went, oh, wow, that was something, you know. I, Brian, I thought you were just like uh, Titanic in that scene, you know, and, and it, 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 it felt, uh, I remember the way you wheeled in the, the dessert trolley or the whatever, whatever was in that tray, you know, that you sort of wheeled it in with this sort of glee and mania. Yeah. And, and the show entered into this, uh, you know, I mean, the show often kind of goes into the absurd. But yeah. that felt in a very exciting way, like we were in this place that felt absurd and it almost felt like we needed a safe word on the set uh, to sort of, you know, uh, uh, yeah. It's funny you should say that because funny enough, that was based, that entrance was based on uh, something I did 30 years ago in Titus Andronicus. I had a very similar entrance where I had to, you know, the Titus is, bake the kids in a pie right and he, and he comes on with his chef's hat and i was wheeling this thing on and it had that kind of ludicrous out of this world dimension and uh, that sort of came back to me as i was doing it that wheeling that trolley i suddenly thought this is a film i couldn't remember what it was this was a familiar thing but suddenly this memory came back from th over 30 years ago and i thought oh i know ah yeah this is how i'll make it work yeah, because because of the sheer, as you say, the absurdity of the whole thing. It it was interesting for me because I wasn't really part of the game or or part of you know I I was a recessive presence in yes in you that. are yeah. but I felt like I was the bore on the floor and had been for the for those four episodes and although I wasn't crawling around on the floor and being force fed sausages, uh, uh, it, you know, in, in a sense I was and, and far worse. Yeah. But then he puts his hands on you, right? Which is like such a powerful moment in that scene where you're sort of like, oh wow, he just got a cage put over him. You know, everybody else is a target here, but he just got a shield. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's how it felt, you know, to me watching it. Yeah. And, and for me too, cause that was the moment when he comes at me, I couldn't help I knew, you know, I feel like I know what's happening. I, I was scared every time. I was scared that something different was going to happen. Every yeah, time. yeah. He, if, if Brian just yelled, four on the floor, I was going to have to walk over to the corner. Like, all right. It was pretty scary every time. Matthew, what is it like to shoot those big, huge scenes, like with the whole family that have to be really, I assume, carefully choreographed? What are those like? Uh, I love I love them. I love those great big scenes. The kind of longer the better. It feel they feel very. Um, I don't know. It feels like doing. I I I've done a lot of theatre and I it feels like doing a play and it, and they're very energizing because you're you have to because they're so long and usually we do these long takes because we have lots of cameras. You're everyone's concentrating and it's and it sort of flies by and it's not a chore. It's sort of wonderful. It makes you, um, as an actor, it makes you less, it makes you stop worrying about what you're doing and paying attention to the others, I find always, yeah. um, which is great. I, I'm sort of sails by and it's, it's just thrilling because it's different every time. And so I love them. I love them, the great big set piece scenes that we get, like on the yacht or the Thanksgiving or, you know, it's great. And often the camera just floats around picking up the dialogue, but also what we're saying on the other end of the table. Kind of we do these, you no, know, we have these, we have these often at dinners, you know, like the dinner with the, um, the pierces and it's just great because often, you know, when you shoot those conventionally, sometimes it's very deadening because the camera works its way around the table and you're doing a sort of mid shot and close up and all that. But um, the way we shoot it, the cameras, are, the, the operators are so skilled and clever and they know the scenes as well as we do, you know, they're sort of picking bits off willy nilly and it's thrilling, I think. Yeah, it's sort of like, it, it does feel a lot like doing a play. And uh, there's an, I talked to an actor recently who mentioned the word coverage, and I was like, we don't really do coverage <laughs> in our show. That's just yeah. not something we do. 
you just do the scene a bunch and they pick it up. Have I don't my coverage. Yeah. Huh? yeah where, are you getting my coverage? Where's, where's my coverage? Yeah. <laughs> But you're, yeah. you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right, Matthew. Each scene, each of the scenes are, are very much written like little playlets. I mean, every, you know, if you think about the scene and the last, the big scene on the, on the boat, you know, the, before the scene with Jeremy, uh, the scene, the bore on the floor. Uh, so many of the scenes had, you know, and, and also with the great Mylord at the helm at times, he very much, shoots it in a sort of, it's like you're doing a theater piece. It's very much like you're doing a theater piece. There's a kind of middle beginning and an end to each scene and, and they're brilliantly crafted. I mean, that is really down to the writers. We've got to really be grateful and thankful to the writers for that because they never, they, they always keep people present and there's always, and they've always got hundreds of alt lines for Kieran. <laughs> they, 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 they also, the process generally gives primacy to, to us, the actors. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes on movies and television, you have to sort of shoehorn yourself into the shape of a shot or, or feel like you have to execute a certain thing. I don't ever feel a pressure to execute anything or to achieve some kind of result on camera. There's, in a way, the, the, the sense of the scrutiny of the camera is completely absent. And what that does, at least for me, is, is frees you up from, from, the, from the sense of, you know, making something at all and allows you to really enter into it and, um, you know, in, in a real moment to moment way and make these discoveries, which is, is harder to do if the process doesn't allow you to enter into a flow. Yeah, yeah I found um, there's a scene that Holly and I did in the Dundee when we were in Glasgow and we did do a formal setup. We had like two cameras on a dolly, both like we did her side and we did my side separately and they were sort of like coming towards us. And that was the first time that I was like, oh my gosh, I can't act. Suddenly I'm on camera. Like everything <laughs> became really obvious because we're so used to the operators just like moving in and out of around us that they feel like they're in the scene as well. Like everything's a dance. That uh, yeah, suddenly seeing a camera was so off-putting somehow. Yeah. I'm, I haven't done another job since <laughs> this and I'm terrified to go back to doing like, we're gonna do an over the shoulder. I'm like, I don't know what that means anymore. I don't know what hitting a mark means. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Like it's just terrifying to do another job. But to also like Jeremy's point too, it's like, you know, I've worked on things where this is the story you have to make it fit in this little box. And sometimes you can't, but you just have to. And the show, it feels like if it doesn't work, then we sort of do something else. It becomes something else, uh, which is great. And that is really just a testament to how great and how talented the writers are too, to just go with and it. The, There's no ego and, either. Go ahead. Sorry. And the crew, the crew also has kind of adapted to this too. Like the props mm -hmm. department, I know Kieran's had this a lot. Like they just sort of bring a bunch of options. They're like, I know you're going to want to touch one of these things in the room or you're going to, so they set you up to sort of have plenty of options of things to do in a, whatever set you're in. And then the camera guys, like I remember in the panic room, I don't know, Matthew, if you remember this, but at one point I was like, on the next take, I, I think I'm going to go under the desk. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to hide under the desk. And one of our camera guys was like, don't tell me. Like, you don't need to tell me. I want to just watch it as it happens. Wow. If you do that, I'm going to find you. If you don't, you're good. So just like, I'm with you in this. I want to track this like an audience is. And I was like, this is next level. This is a whole different thing. I love it. You know, I, I, think, I think we really should say something about that because I do think we have been mm -hmm. incredibly rock lucky with our camera operators and our DPs. We really have. I mean, those guys and gals have been really incredible. And they, they got it so quickly. And, and, they, and you could tell they were, they were liberated by it. They were liberated in the same way that we were liberated. Absolutely, liberated. they love it just as much as we do. Yeah. And, it's a and, thrilling way to work. Yeah, and, 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 and it sort of has become, <laughs> it, it, it really is the family. The family is not just us, but the family is also the crew. Yeah. Uh, very much so. They, they, they really are part of the pulse of the whole thing. And we couldn't do it, we clearly couldn't do it without them. And they're very smart, they're very sharp, and they're very liberated. They'll, they, they do things and suddenly they, they pick on a scene, pick on a moment, pick on a beat, and it gets in there, you know. 
because we always do uh, <laughs> Mark Mylod's famous freebie, but also the crews get freebie as well. The, the operators get freebie. And so it's mm -hmm. With all that like extraordinary freedom and liberation that we have, which is so valued, I don't quite understand how the soundies are able to do what they do then, because I've only done like maybe 10, 15 lines of, of ADR over two seasons. And we totally. talk about each other all the time. I just think that's like, that's insane. Because so many times, usually you get like, could you just make sure you don't go over that person's line so we can get it clean? Make sure you don't crinkle a chip packet, all that. Like, I don't know what they're doing with them magicians, like writing yeah. sound. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I, I worked on a movie this fall with two of our camera operators who were, who were you know, uh, uh, who were on the movie for, for, for most of it and who were, completely straight jacketed and unable to work in a, in a, in a fluid way. And, and it, it really affected me as well because I, you know, uh, uh, because I also felt straight jacketed and it made me really appreciate the container that we're in. Like if there's good work being done, it's the writing, but it's also whatever that alchemy is that yeah, whatever absolutely. the container is that we all get to. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. It feels like the whole crew, like everyone comes together to make the show because they kind of believe in it. And Nick, when you mentioned like props, like there was a, a scene, Monica's done things where she sets props that she thinks I'm going to play with. She has like a Monica's game. Amazing. And yeah. Jay, Jay, there's a scene with you where oh, I took the flower and I put it in my ear or whatever the hell it was. And after the first take, I went up to Monica. I was like, good luck resetting that shit. She goes, I knew you were going to go for the flowers. I bought a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. Well, that that, that yeah. dinner with the Pierces, that that thing was monumental. The, mm. Every time they had yeah. a match, every time, and how many times did we do that? It was a two-day event, yeah. uh, mm. uh, covering that scene, you know. And talking yeah. all of us on the table at the same time, like the scene's yeah. happening down the other end of the table, and we're talking at the like I, that's just insane to me. I mean, Brian, the scene that you and I did on the yacht at the end before yeah. I leave, I, I'm sure you remember. We, st we started rehearsing it a little bit. And then I had one of my, you know, whatever you want to call it and, and asked if we could stop rehearsing it and just do it. And we hadn't figured out the blocking and, and, and we were losing light, the sun was going down. So we, so we found the scene mm -hmm. on the vine and the camera, you know, they, the camera was, they were crossing each other. They didn't, but, but you know, it felt in a way if we had, uh, well, it was just very exciting that we we're able to do that and that they're able to do, to, to do this dance with us. I think, I think that's right, Jeremy. I think that we, we, we did achieve such a level of trust by then because this was the 10th episode. So that, and that was what's so exciting. And that was the thing that, I mean, I've done, you know, I've done a lot of television as, as we all have, but I've never quite known it like this. I've never quite known it as, holistic as this has been yeah, that's a good word experience yeah you know I, i've never quite known it like i mean i've you know i've had great times don't i'm not dishing anybody but there is just something extraordinary about the whole shooting of our show which is so unique to itself and unique to everybody involved and everybody you know the monica can anticipate that you know that the guys know that they can go there as opposed to there i mean uh, they, they don't want to, as the guy said to you, Nick, I, you know, don't tell me, I'll find you. You know, they, they were really tuned in a way. And I just think it's, I think it's astonishing. And I do think it's because mm -hmm. of the writing. I do actually think it is because of the way the whole thing is struck. We have this genius, this sort of benign, lovely, <laughs> funny genius, Jesse Armstrong, who's there all the time on set, usually yeah. with Tony or Lucy or somebody, you know, and it feels like they're just there. It's just amazing. I've never had that. That's amazing. You can go and they're just a brilliant resource and they're sort of encouraging yeah. and, you know, it's, it's fantastic. There's also the safety in knowing that if you, you think you might be pushing something a little too far, they have an eye. Like Jesse in particular, like where the, the buck stops with him. If it's a little too silly, there's one thing I probably can't talk about, but there's one thing I was worried was too silly that we rehearsed, we were going to shoot. Jesse came on set and was like, that's too much. And it was like, I, can, I completely trust his eye. Um, totally. Right. How alive are the script? So you've talked about this a little bit, and Brian was talking about it at the beginning. Do you know anything that's going to happen to your characters episodes ahead? And, and how do you play it if not? There's, I've had times where um, 
you know, in like the first season and, and I asked Jesse, it seemed not to track with what I thought for Shiv, which was, does she want to be at Waystar? Does she want the top job? And he was like, I don't think so. Which <laughs> totally threw me. It was like the third, it was like the second or third episode of the first season. I was like, wow, what? Oh, okay, I have to really reconsider this character. But then it just sort of was like, well, it doesn't matter if she changes her mind. It, we as humans hide things from ourselves so well and deceptively sometimes that even us, we don't know them until they, until they happen, until you sort of are presented with the opportunity to say yes, that you didn't realize that you wanted that all along. So I, 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 for me, it's like present moment is so exciting because of all the, you know, the trust that Jeremy was talking about before. We there's, also, there's also, in our, we need to in go. Our, there's also in our genius, our genius uh, creator, uh, a, a streak of capriciousness. Uh, you know, in a good sense, I don't, I don't, I don't knock it. I, I, I'm all for caprice. And he, example being, for nine episodes, I thought I was born in Quebec, Canada. <laughs> and then, you know, and then finally on the ninth episode at the wedding, Peter Friedman sits down and he says, oh, by the way, I've just done an ADR session. Oh, yeah. He said, yeah, they've changed your birthplace. And I said, <laughs> What do you mean they've changed my birthplace? He said, yeah, you're not born in Quebec anymore. I said, so where am I born? He said, I can't remember. He said, hang on, I'll look it up. And he looked up. He said, hey, you're born in somewhere called Dundee, Scotland. I said, that's where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> but where did that come from? And I, I, when I went up to Jesse and I said, what's going on? What? And he just, and this is what he said. We thought it'd be a little surprise. I said, surprise? I mean, you know, for nine episodes, I, did, I didn't know any of that. And of course, my les the lesson I learned from that was it didn't really matter that I didn't know. It yeah. actually didn't really matter that I didn't know. It, it, in fact, it's none of my business whether I know or not. My business is being in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. right in the moment. And I, not, you know. Jesse does this thing about like, um, I reserve the right to change my mind. And I think that's just like perfect because it means you can have the um, belief in yourself and they can have the belief in you to just trust to make a decision and have an opinion but then but, it doesn't like if you're present and you're in the moment then it doesn't matter because you reserve the right to change your mind later it, it, that's right it, it takes a I little do. like adjust but i had the the same thing of like what but i don't understand where the, where's the character going but now i love the fact that i can't track yeah. i don't I, it's just whatever we're doing on that day sometimes i don't quite even know what the scene is until the morning of and it's like well that's just how it is i don't think of you others have noticed but i i certainly have noticed that throughout the whole experience that the strengths of all of you have come to the fore and they've used that. I've, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed of how the writers have used the strengths of each book. You know, there's not one of you that's not being developed in a particular way that is incredibly exciting. And, but it's also based on what you do, you individually do. And I think that's an extraordinary gift that they've got that they pick up on the individual actor and they say, I'm going to take her this way. I'm going to take her that way. And then of course we, we love it because we go along with it, you know, because we, we love the sense of the immediate. But I think, I, 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 I really do think that, you know, when you think of the first series and how it developed into the second series, certainly there's been a kind of burgeoning of us as players but us in relationship to our characters and how our characters have developed for us in a way, which I think is quite extraordinary, actually. I've never known that experience either before. Maybe some of us sort of hound Jesse more than others, but I've certainly hounded yeah. Who would that, which, who, who would that be? <laughs> who, who's well, a hounder? Jeremy. Oh, I, I've hounded him because I can't just, I, I need to know, I, I need to know. And so, I've known for both seasons, at least, you know, not, not storyline for everyone, but I, you know, so that you can thread the needle and build the thing, but because it, yes, the, the job is to be in the moment, but I, I, for me at least, I can't sort of simply do that and be a goldfish, you know, uh, uh, there has to be a, con you have to construct something and when you know what the final beat of something is, then you can reverse engineer it and set yourself at the furthest distance from it so you can travel 
that distance and 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 so and i and i i i I would find it very difficult. I mean, it, it would be interesting because you, Brian, you're probably right. You may, you may not need to know. Uh, well, it's, it's a different. I mean, I just think that what's been created on our show is a whole different paradigm, and uh, going in an organic way that I that is unknown. Um, and I, at first, I was very like you. I you know I like to know what I'm doing, and I was very kind of oh I don't I'm not sure about this. But ultimately, ultimately, I found it freeing. I found it freeing that I didn't know. I wasn't. And we all need what we need. Everybody works in a different way. And I think, exactly. I think that Jesse is very accommodating in that way. And and if you need to know something, well. then he's going to help you out. And if, if yeah. you're so if an actor happy needs with not knowing, he's going to let you be. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I feel like the dynamic works with the three of us. I would like in terms of the three of us, the four of us in terms of siblings. Like, I'm, I feel used like people... I'm, I'm used to that. I'm used to that. It's, uh, it's that not, was such a true thing to say. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Holy wow. Shit. I don't think you said that because you're all in different spots in the box. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. I know. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm um, over here in this spot. No, but, so, but it, so. we're all sort of like working different kinds of, uh, in different ways, which I think is like, that then helps our characters and the way that like, the way that we are as actors together and the way that we are with um the, the way we relate to jesse and you know like yes jeremy needs more information about his character i feel like that works like the fact that i don't the fact that i know that jeremy knows more about kendall makes shiv go like do you know i think that's and i love that that's great mm -hmm. like not knowing until the end what happened at the end of season two and then discovering i was like, <gasps> you know, like i will never change change that fact i loved that experience and then knowing that you knew, it was like, oh, it's so delicious. Yes. For me, every other job has been that way. And this job has just been freeing to give myself over to. <laughs> Jeremy, what do you mean by goldfish? <laughs> you call it Garrett a goldfish? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, being, in, being observed in a bowl, living in a glass bowl, you know, oh, like no. you have to do. The memory. I thought it was just like, I'm swimming around and he, Jesse just gives me treats and I'm like. <laughs> So you might, well, that goes back to that hunger thing. You. I don't you were think you're a girl. There were only four biscuits, you know, and seven kids. I think you're a, you're, a top of the water. you're a thoroughbred. <laughs> and any thought given to, to whom you might sure. hand over the keys? Why, madam, that is very forward. And you're no fun. We're all friends here now, aren't we? Well, uh... Jerry is on the paperwork as a stopgap, but even she'd be the first to admit that she couldn't really do the job. Well, maybe the second to admit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a name, but you know, I really don't like to deal in hypotheticals. Mm. He's an enigma. Well, one day. Oh, what a tease, folks. Just whisper it in my ear. You know, I'll start to think I'm not wanted. <laughs> this is, you can... Well, you know... Oh, for fuck's sake, Dad, just tell him it's gonna be me. Is that so? That is so. Roman, what's happening? My life is tended. It's been discussed, uh, but I don't think we're quite at the point where... Uh... No, not anytime soon. We've, uh, we've discussed the transition and some arrangements. We won't bore you. <laughs> no, but I thought we could tell you. All, though, as friends. Yeah. You know, maybe this dinner was a little bit premature. Seems like you guys are still working some things out. Uh, no, no, Peter, don't worry. This is just... Uh... Family hijinks as, as usual. We're good. Is that true? Will you stop? <laughs> well, Sarah, how did you feel when you learned that Shiv would make that critical mistake of announcing her secret conversations with Logan? <laughs> uh, I loved it. Like, as Matthew was saying before, it, that you know, those playlets, those, those scenes work as little plays. And it's kind of, 
great to then, you know, with the present moment plot and arc for a scene that, uh, that if you don't know necessarily what's going to happen in the next couple of episodes, you do for that episode. And then within the scene, they're so great at structuring a journey for all the characters at the table. Like we've got, you know, we had 15 people at that table and each of them have a reason to be there at a conversation to be having with, with whomever. And uh, yeah, I, I love that because you know, the chair is also where like Martha placed me is like this end of the table that's going on. And then she can kind of dip into that over there. Um, yeah. No, I, yeah. It's, it's, and, and with a great big, like cat amongst the pigeons moment, which also changed as we were, as we were performing it, as we were rehearsing. And then, and then as we did it, it kind of wasn't working, I guess. And, 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 uh, well, it was working, but like Jesse ended up going to this, like, situation of going well what do you what would you want to say what what's the uh what's the first thing that comes to your mind like let's just simplify it it was like a much more wordy thing that we'd written um that he'd written and then yeah we just simplified and simplified and it turns into this sort of very short kind of bleh, word vomit and then the most i think the most terrified i've ever been on set in anything ever was when you brian started dinging your glass in a take and she like she sort of stands up and everybody leaves and the scene as written is over long before that but then what i love about the way that we shoot is like we'll play it out until the moment's done and then the edit will they'll cut and they'll they'll change it and shape it but playing out to the moment's done what is going to happen when when logan and Shiv are faced with each other and you dinging that crystal glass is like just the death knell <laughs> i've never been so terrified i saw a, i saw a little bit of it the other night i was like wow my face is like that's like i've just seen death come come with the side yeah it's it's a fun it was a funny scene that scene because it, it it's so naked and you suddenly it's like you take all your clothes off suddenly <laughs> you know and i thought it's it's kind of shocking i always found it shocking Mm. That you did what you did. And I thought, is it in character? Is this what she does? I mean, is this who she is? Because it, it, it was such a surprise that suddenly in a, a forum where we don't know who the people are, we're guests, that she suddenly blows it so big. It's such well, a The look on your face, the look on your face after she made her announcement was, it, it all showed. Oh, you, you didn't right. say a word. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was just it was Mark, shocking. Mark comes in the edit. Mark comes back to you so often in that scene that just to get like you're always checking in in the way he's edited it. You're always checking in with Logan. Like even if you don't think that he where his position is on the table, that could he genuinely hear hear that conversation? But you just get this little like shade of something as you go past. It's brilliant. So that when that does happen, it's you. All you want to do is see that see what Logan's reaction is to that moment. Yeah. Alan, there's a moment in the finale when um, when Kendall is referred to, I think by Jerry, as uh, the firstborn, and then she corrects herself. Um, uh, yeah, we just saw an another little bit of that right with, with yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, how, how, like, is that something that you have in mind at, when you're playing Connor? I, you know, I think for for. Uh, uh, his whole life, he's been on the outside of the glass with his nose pressed against it, looking in a bit, you know, and every now and then they say, come in, come in, come in, come in. And uh, many times they don't. So I just think that's that's part of his truth. That's part of his life, that the old man left me and my mother when I was eight years old or so. And then then he had the golden trio. And um, that's how things are. For our last clip, we're going to show the final scene of season two, the press conference with Kendall when he turns the tables on Logan. My father is a malignant presence, a bully and a liar. And he was fully personally aware of these events for many years and made efforts to hide and cover up. He had a twisted sense of loyalty to bad actors like Lester McClintock. Fuck me. disregard for the safety of migrant workers, non-union and union workers, and for vulnerable performers and guests. My father keeps a watchful eye 
over every inch of his whole empire. And the notion that he would have allowed millions of dollars in settlements and compensation to be paid without his explicit approval is utterly fanciful. I have with me today copies of records that show his personal sign-off. How much those of us who executed his wishes bear responsibility is for another day. But I think this is the day his reign ends. I'll be providing the documents and can answer any questions you may have in the coming days. Thank you very much. Mr. Roy, do you have anything to say to the victims of these crimes? Did your father know you were making this statement today? Jeremy, let's break the scene down. What was that like to play? Um, daunting. Because not unlike season one, the sort of whole uh, architecture of the season hinged on, for me, hinged on um, sort of a single scene or moment uh, happening. Uh, and and I, I, you know, it, it was a bit of a contentious um, episode for me in terms of the script and, and, and the reasons and, you know, what was the, what is the, what is the hammer and the firing pin that, that, reverses, uh, you know, that, that, that is the catalyst for such a, such a complete uh, uh, about face. Um, but when Jesse and I sort of arrived at a mutual understanding about what those reasons were and, 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 uh, and, and doing the scene with Brian, uh, it, it, f it then felt inevitable. Um, but the scene itself, I remember the day actually, I remember Sarah was there because she was sort of shadowing the director and and that made me very nervous. And Sorry. uh it was so great though. It was like such a joy to watch. And and you know, it's one of those days, honestly, where you feel like you're supposed to be the quarterback and you're like you keep fumbling the ball. For me is how I felt that day. Um, because I expected the scene to be very uh kind of just in the pocket. Like we had a table read, it felt quite simple. Um, but it it was not simple uh uh to do it turned out and we did many 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 takes of it and i found myself sort of backsliding a bit i initially was thrown off by the microphones which had been set up without real sound um so i wasn't speaking into a microphone that was amplified in the room and that took a bunch of takes to sort of fix it to make the environment feel real but it just turned on a consciousness in my mind that I can't have on in my mind. Anyway, um, after a lot of takes, I think there was one take where I, I paused after the word but, which is in the middle of this speech and sort of the but pivot. Yeah. And, 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 and that was sort of when it all, that was the take where it sort of found itself for me. Like, it felt like, you know, there's this Wallace Stevens poem where he says, uh, after the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. And it felt like it needed to be that magnitude of a moment for Kendall. Um, and so that sort of rest after the but, and then the rest of it sort of took care of itself. And I tore up a paper in that take and that's what they, that's what they ended up using. And, but it was not an easy, it, that, that was a, that was like a, a, you know, I struggled with that scene. It just goes to well, show you don't, as an actor, you have no idea, you know, because it, 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 it I think it works as a scene, uh, but you have no idea, you know, your own feelings are not often a reliable gauge of anything. Um, I would say it does work. <laughs> um, uh, Brian, what 
is Logan thinking when he has that little half smile in the final shot of the season? Well, I can't really tell you that. Um, because you can. Again, you can. I, no, I can't. It's a secret. While you're at uh, it, tell us about season three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you about that. No, the, the interesting thing is there are, there are several, there are several, there are several things that added to that smile. There's pride. There's audacity. There's surprise. There's uh, uh, respect. There's uh, devilishness. I mean, there's so many elements to that. You know, there's so many elements to what that smile means. And also the fact that in the previous scene, you know, the key thing is when he asks, uh, do I, you know, can I, is there any way I can run the business? Can I do it? And he says, and Logan says, honestly, he doesn't know. And he doesn't know if he's a killer. And of course, what he proves to be in that scene is a killer. A little bit uh, Robert Ford shooting Jesse James, but a killer nevertheless. <laughs> you know, uh, it, 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 so it, it, it's, and it's a kind of, you know, it's just, they, they, they talk about it. And it's the Mona Lisa smile, you know, so in a way, it, there is, it's open to so many interpretations, as it should be. Yeah, you know? you're what you're allowing. It's such, a, it's such a beautifully subtle thing you're doing. You're allowing, you know, everyone to project whatever they want onto Exactly. You. And that's exactly. what you've got to do. You know, you can't, you know, you, you can't put what you, because it, it's too simple. It's too, it's, sim, it's simplistic if you kind of go, well, I'm, what I'm doing is this and I'm doing that because I made him do this and I wanted him to do that. It isn't that. That certainly you can put it into the mix, but there's more going on, much more going on. And, and there's the history of, there's a lot of histories involved. There's the, there's the dramatic history. There's also the history of us having have done two extraordinary seasons of that show and it culminating in that. Having done a similar episode, not quite the same, but when Jeremy accidentally kills the boy, or he's, he doesn't kill the boy, but the boy is killed in that accident. And then we, I, I, I take him under my wing, as it were, and become very protective of him, as I am for quite a lot of season two. And then at the same time, knowing that he, kind of having this gut feeling that he will be sacrificed. I don't know when, but where and how, but I've got this feeling. So it's, 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 a, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, the, the work is fascinating. The scripts are fascinating. And the, 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 just the kind of the sense of ensemble, as Matthew talked about earlier, the sense of all of us this group, which is an, a, a great group, a truly, truly extraordinary group. And it's such a talented group, so that you, you're in totally safe, yet dangerous hands. <laughs> hey, what do you think that Jerry wants from the family? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, I feel like she's just always um, gotten sort of addicted to like just staying on her feet there like like she enjoys the strategy strategizing of staying afloat um i think she's probably more ambitious than than she makes out that she is so i mean i feel like this past season once jerry's name was on as the surrogate you know possible uh you know the, the fallback person yeah uh, she she fell out of favor with Logan like he like he just didn't like me as much because I was somehow a, like in the line of succession and that made me less because I felt like I was much more his right hand man in season one in the beginning at least the beginning of season two I was in the doghouse relatively so I feel like I don't know I feel like she's gotten sort of addicted to like she was you know a workaholic and she's gotten kind of addicted to jockeying for her position there. Um, I don't know. I think she, but at the same time, I, 
feel like she keeps it a little distance from, I mean, I think she has her opinions about the Roys. Like she, there's definitely a psychological distance there. Does that make any sense? Really? Um, do you ha guys have any sense of when you might film the third season? Brian, anyone doing anything? Brian knows everything apparently. Yeah, well, Brian, I've, had my, I've had my wrist slapped because I, I, I said something about, you know, we don't know when it's going to happen. It could be blah, it could be blah. And when I did that, they edited it as if I was saying it's blah. They did that on an interview. So I'm very wary of that situation. I got very firmly wrapped across the knuckles by HBO. But I didn't actually. I, what I said was, well, it could be October, but it, you know, it's unlikely in, when it will be. It'll be when it's safe to be, you know, and when they've sorted out. I mean, they've, they've, they've got a, they're all working now. I mean, they're, they're having the ADs, the, the, there's an AD association who at the moment is looking into what we could do, how we could get back to program making. And clearly there are certain areas that we could go to where we could film. Uh, New York probably isn't particularly safe at the moment. And who knows when New York will be safe. Um, and unfortunately that's where the hub of our stuff is. But of course we do do a lot of traveling. And, you know, so there will be elements of how that's going to be curtailed and that's got to be changed within the terms of the writing. So there's a lot of elements of that that's got to be dealt with. So we have a brilliant, brilliant exec uh, line producer called Scott Ferguson, and he's been working on it daily. I know that because I'm in constant touch with him. He's working on it daily to try and see what the best situation is vis-a-vis our crews and keeping together and being safe. The first thing is we have to be safe. Uh, we have to be safe, we have to be tested, we have to be well before we begin to even think about it. So it's very, very hard to say. Uh, and it also depends on the behavior of the, the country. It depends on the behavior of what's going on, you know, where people are, you know, people are, but they've reached a point where the, the novelty of it got exhausted. And so they wanted to, oh, let's go out. Let's all go to parks now. It's happening in London. You know, it's happening in New York. It's happening. And it's still not a good time to be doing any of that. We really have to be careful. But people are, you know, human beings. They are a little disappointing sometimes. <laughs> so, I, think, I, think, I think the good news about HBO is, and this is just my sense of it, is that they're never going to put pressure on, uh, they're not gonna do anything that will compromise the show. Absolutely. So Jesse, so Jesse's gonna write the season as he wishes, and then they will calibrate to, in order to realize whatever his vision is for season three. And, and I think the timing of that and, the, and where he decides to set everything, uh, the, the rest will follow the scripts, but the scripts remain king and they're not gonna do any sort of watered down version of the show in order to get it back into, back on track, you know, for a deadline, I think, which would, which, so, so I th the good news is we, our home is, is somewhere that will protect, I think, the integrity of the show. Um, for my final question, uh, if everyone could just say their favorite line that they got to say in season two, um, uh-oh. I got, I got. I can't think of one. I can't think of okay. a favorite one. I, I got two, but neither of them aired. Oh, okay. Um, one, well, no, I, one is my favorite piece of written dialogue I think I've ever been given. And it was, uh, it was something, and I'm gonna, and now I don't even fully remember it. It was like, Roman makes fun of Frank, and then I have to say, no, I'm kidding, Frank. We missed all your, it was like written as, we missed all your wonderful blah, blah, and all of your, and then it says, makes noises. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. like, just your blah, blah, and all your wonderful, derp, derp, like, just whatever they want. <laughs> and then my favorite alt line they gave me, which also didn't get used, was, um, in the first episode of the second season, Willa gets to contribute us. She's like, I think Cell seems cool. 
And they gave me like 12 different lines to say, so I got to do a different one each time. And one was, uh, I said, um, oh, I didn't realize we were taking contributions from the floor. Why don't we call the guy who waxes my balls and see what he thinks? And I remember the moment I finished that, I looked at you, Matthew, and you just went, mm. <laughs> ears in your eyes. Right. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Those are mine. Who else? Don't make me call on people. I have, one, I have one. I have one. You go. I yeah. have one. Um, this was a good one because it felt like what Brian was saying earlier, like the writers were really starting to understand me, but we've never talked about this. Um, and it's in the season finale, the line that goes, but, you know, I get on the yacht and I go, can, can I keep my shoes on? Because uh, what if my toenails are not all that aesthetically pleasing? And I have gnarly toenails on my two big toes and I, I went up to Jesse and then I was like did I tell you about my toes because I had one of my toenails like ripped off a few years ago because I had a problem with it and they were like no but it was just a perfect understanding that of course I have some weird ass toenails so, You've spoken about so then they shot like an insert on them and I think thank god that didn't make the cut the insert you'd spoken about that like three or four days earlier so when we read I when I read the script I was like oh Nick must have told them. That's weird that he told them. <laughs> was, yeah, I remember that. There are so many like things that the writers put that must be like some version of an insult where they wrote about Connor. They were like in reference to Connor. They said, oh, is he the one with the face? <laughs> <laughs> who, said, who said that? Who said that? I can't remember. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Was. But... It was season one. They were like, oh, is this your brother, the one with the face? I was, like, oh, I was, that, was that, was that uh, when we were in New Mexico? Yeah. Yeah. When, when, uh, uh, Kendall was in the bar. Yeah, with I think guys. it was with those guys. <laughs> that your brother, the one with the face. I can't remember that. I'm like, what does that even mean? I don't know. Well, yeah. it means this. Yeah. I have one uh, um, uh, in Connor's uh, little YouTube video to plant the seeds of his uh, presidential uh, platform. Uh, he says, "Ding dong, who's there? Uncle Sam." And where's his hand? In my pants, <laughs> where the money is. And that, that that's Connor esque. That's uh, <laughs> that's right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> Matthew, do you have a a, a Tom Tom? I do. It's very vulgar. Say it. Like, very Fine. rude. It was just a very short line to um, Jay and David. We were outside, and I had to say they're trying to persuade me to go and talk to Logan. And I'm scared and I say, I'm trying to get out of it. And I say, well, he, he did once call me the cunt of Monte Cristo. <laughs> uh, I really love that. That's hilarious. Uh, but really, there are too many to mention. That's the thing. Yeah. Jeremy, do you I have... remember, like, I liked saying uh, to you, uh, Matthew, uh, stop angsting, you know, you're angsting. What, what did I say even? I'm trying to remember. But I, we couldn't, I, I couldn't say it to yeah. you without cracking up. We were just, yeah, yeah. you know, kept, that's the joy of it. I especially yeah. like it when Matthew goes. He just, it's I a, go very ready. Yeah. I don't that have like a precious. favorite, Stop like, me. a favorite, like, fun line. Uh, it doesn't have to but be. I, but I guess the line that was sort of like the ballast of the whole thing for me in a way was when Sarah and I, have that scene in the office in in, oh. in in the episode where she's come into the office and I'm up on the ledge on the roof a lot. Uh, and I say, I, I don't know what the exact line was, but like, it, it, it won't be me. Um, because, yeah, just because it, it contained everything about the season for me. Um, I believed it to be true and at that time i believed that i would be make a sacrifice of myself but then but the way in which what is embedded within that what what ultimately happens i remember reading that line and being really floored floored by it and then when you said it matthew was in the corner breaking yeah <laughs> he breaks easily <laughs> i think that's unfair but yeah anyway. <laughs> It's Sarah, delicious when he when he goes. Sarah, do you have one? I, well, you just made me think that the that 
that what Shiv says um, at the table, she's such a, um, at the table at the, in episode 10, season two, to you, Matthew, where she's like, when she sort of put, throws you under the bus, that doing mm. that little exchange between us in amongst like such a private little yeah. spat in such a public setting. I love, but my actually, what, it's such a, this line, this line is not mine, but I loved every time Matthew said this, was the King of Edible Leaves. This, oh, His Majesty, the King of Edible right. Leaves, the spinach. That is just the spinach. <laughs> it's Fantastic. Just, that just like encapsulates Tom for me, like such an, it's, it's a silence beforehand and so awkward. And then you go, ah, the King of Edible Leaves, His Majesty, the spinach. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, the, the, the problem the problem is I had so many wonderful lines, but I can only remember the rude ones. I can only remember the ones uh, this you is know, just like the, this uh, is gonna what, stream on the internet. It can be rude. I well, just talked about waxing my ball, so we're you're okay. Yeah, all right. yeah. Well that mine is similar mine is similar, which is what's he gonna do next? Stick his cock in my potato salad. <laughs> okay. Oh no, my in the potato salad. So Was that, that one. one but was that after was that the chicken? Line? Yeah, that no. was a line. That was after the chicken. <laughs> chicken. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> salad. You know? oh, actually, that was that was a line that ended up getting cut that I love saying was the um with the like I don't know how do you think he responded and she have got to say I don't know I've never seen the chicken power play before. <laughs> That's <laughs> a great right. one. Oh, it's too bad they cut that. Oh. There, there was one that was cut where where we talked about. I was just really surprised by the line they gave you, Snook. Where it was like, oh yeah, like that time when we all got food poisoning. Uh, <laughs> where where were we? Where were we supposedly getting food poisoning? Wait, oh yes, <laughs> yes. Like, you, yeah. like oh, well, we all got food poisoning and that, that whole like, scene. Like, that whole scene got cut. But we were yeah, we got it. food poisoning in in Italy. And you went, oh yeah, shittily, and I <laughs> lost it. I don't know if you said that or if they gave it to you. I you just went, oh, said it. I just. It just surprised me. Um, everyone, I'm that's all that the thing. time we have. Uh, we'll, we'll end on shittily. Um, oh, <laughs> that's all the time we have. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. This was wonderful. Um, you're, you were amazing. And I, this was terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, you guys. Good to nice see you guys. Nice to see you guys. Nice to you guys. Dylan, Jay, Sarah. Keanu, Keanu. You know we're all coming. <laughs> Keanu. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>